Hi, I'm Gwendolyn Circus Earth Family Law, and I am honored and privileged to have with us today Whitney McDaniel of Associates and Professional Counseling. Whitney and I have known each other for a number of years, and what we want to talk about today is the concept of reunification therapy, because there seems to be a lot of confusion on the issue. So first, Whitney, welcome, and thank you for coming on to give this important information out. Hi, Gwen. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about this topic and educate people on what reunification is and how it can help in the family law courtroom. No, I really appreciate it. So first of all, in reunification therapy, I think sometimes we get confused and I want to start with the basics. Who are the participants? So the participants can be a number of people. So um, in my process, personally, I like to interview all the parties um, that are involved. So that would include, you know, the parents, both parents individually, and then the children individually. And this allows me to kind of get everyone's background and perspective on why they might be coming in for reunification. Now, what is reunification? So reunification is a is a fancy word um, that is being used, which really means that working on a relationship. So that relationship can be um, usually it's between a parent and a child, and either the children are refusing to see a parent or struggling when they have to see a parent. So the point of reunification is to work on that bond um, between the child and the parent that's kind of the identified, you know, issued parent. Got it. Now, what's the role of yourself as the reunification therapy within that structure? So it's really about, you know, having a place where people feel comfortable to talk about some of the issues that they might be experiencing with one or both parents. And the parent feels comfortable talking about some of the issues that they might be having with the children. Um, so it provides a safe space for that to happen. I think people get confused that this is going to be, you know, quote unquote, a typical therapy um, kind of session. But in here, we're really kind of talking about agenda items that each person might have that they need to discuss with the other person, but they don't want to bring them in with their regular therapist because, you know, they have that trusted bond or maybe the parent doesn't want to use a, the therapist that they use individually. So we want to kind of keep everything on neutral ground. So then distinguish for somebody listening today, what really is the difference between counseling and or therapy versus the role of a formal reunification therapy session? So yeah, so a person's going to seek individual counseling or quote unquote family counseling in a situation um, where they're looking at learning coping skills on how to cope with a, diff a difficult situation or to work on emotional regulation, which is, you know, how am I dealing with certain feelings and reactions? And the reunification, I, you know, therapy coaching is really to discuss any problems or concern that the parent-child relationship is happening um, that we can't give a diagnosis to, right? So we can't diagnose the family as depressed. Um, we can say, hey, you know, this situation is causing this person to be depressed, and that's why they should be seeing an individual therapist, but we're really working on family dynamics, working on co-parenting with both parents on how to address um, the children in a unified manner and having a safe place for everyone to be able to talk about things that maybe they don't want to talk about when they're having time with their child. Now, it's my position that it is critical and it sounds like you would agree with that because you have to have both parents involved. So really for this to work in terms of reunification, both parents have to have the objective of the reunification. Would that be true in your opinion? That is a huge thing, right? For it to be successful. There's many times that one parent isn't, you know, right. um, accepting of the reunification and, you know, they still end up in a place like my office or somebody else's office, but it, we're going to have better success when we have the buy-in from all parties. Cause if I have the buy-in from both parents, then I can get the buy-in from the children. Now, is there a concept generally of a favored parent versus an unfavored parent or an alienated parent? And can you describe those situations? Sure. So a lot of times 
you know, people get ordered by the courts for reunification because they're in a high conflict divorce or situation. And most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time there is a favored parent and there is an unfavored parent. Um, And so, you know, that is why it's important for both parties to buy in, right? Um, I would say most of the time the favored parent doesn't realize or want to accept maybe how they're contributing um, to the problem. And in extreme circumstances, we see that, you know, an alienation, which I know is a really, you know, hot word these days, um, that, you know, everyone's accusing the other party of alienating from the kids. Um, We do see that a lot in reunification work. Um, And so that is stuff that we talk about when I bring both parents in here to discuss how they're going to be on the same page when we present the different items, whether that's, you know, starting out the community with dinner with the unfavored parent, or if the kids, you know, say certain things to the favored parent, how they should respond so that we can work on, you know, rebuilding that relationship. It's almost like a form of emotional permission, isn't it? Yes. Um, So a lot of the times I'll meet with the parents, if we're going to uh, work on a homework assignment and my homework assignments are, you know, telephone calls, dinners outside my office, you know, parenting time, you know, homework as we build on this um, relationship. So I'll bring both parents in and they will actually deliver the message in my office to the children. So the children can see that both parents, you know, are giving them quote unquote permission to, you know, have this happen. Um, and then if the children kind of, you know, get upset and rebel, then I have the favored parents reinforce, right, that, hey, this is, you're going to have a great time, you know, you're still going to see Miss Whitney or whoever, but really give them the confidence um, that it's okay that this is happening. Now, I would think that some of these sessions really end up being an opportunity for everybody to get the elephant out of the room, right? Or they got to talk about it at some point. Do you feel yes. that that's an important role in reunification? It is. I mean, it. I always tell people because they're usually not happy, right, when they end right. up in my office. But this is an opportunity for everyone to say whatever they need to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of times the children will tell the favored parent things and not the unfavored parent okay. things. And so this is an opportunity you know, wherever I get the information from, for me to then bring that up also, um, because we want to have this open dialogue. And I think it's important for the kids. Sometimes they get confused when we're in this process is that, you know, they want the same authority, right. As the favored parent has. And so there's like this off balance of, of power, if you will. Um, And so really understanding where everyone's place is, you know, when parties separate. Now there's this concept and, you know, of gatekeeping and you hear that word and parents are becoming somewhat confused by that. So can Mm -hmm. you explain that concept and why that's maybe a buzzword now? So, yeah. So, you know, I'm hearing the word gatekeeping quite a bit. People are educating themselves more on what parent alienation is, or they've gotten a forensic evaluation and maybe the evaluator has 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 said, hey, alienation's not occurring, but gatekeeping is. And, you know, it can happen in positive and negative things, but you know, for my line of work, it's usually for the negative. Sure. Um, and so, you know, there's a difference between gatekeeping and alienation. So Gatekeeping is is when the favored parent is encouraging just enough, right? So that um, they aren't accused of keeping the children away um, from the other parents. Or the gatekeeper says just enough information out loud in front of the children that that might negatively impact what the children think. So they're doing just enough right? To encourage the relationship, but they're not what people call forcing the relationship. Um, Unlike when I have an alienated parent, um, the kids refuse, right? To usually see the parent, talk about the parents, all their favorable memories are now, you know, rewritten and, you know, nothing, you know, happy has ever happened or good um, with, with the, you know, unfavorable parent. So I guess gatekeeping is like the first, the first step, right. right? Um, Of when we're not so supportive of a relationship and then, you know, it moves on to alienation where there's 
a total disconnect, um, that there's no relationship happening. You know, in gatekeeping, in your opinion, should it be a warning sign that something needs to be done to stop this? I definitely think it should be a warning sign um, because things can be reversed, right? If people are aware of their own behaviors. So, you know, I'll, I'll take it for what it's worth. Maybe they don't understand, you know, how they're impacting um, the relationship with the kids and the other party. And that's where the education piece comes along, right? And possibly an individual therapist to really work on, you know, maybe some of their own projection that they might have towards, you know, their spouse or significant other um, to support a healthy relationship. So the objectives really are different between reunification therapy than in that family counseling that would, in terms of changing those behaviors or making them improvements. Those improvements. Yes. So I, I always say family counseling is for um, parties that, that get along and like each other and can reason with each other, right? Reunification, in my experience, is, is really with high conflict individuals who everyone needs a lot of work, right? And so people can't just go into, um, I say, a quote unquote, a normal therapist office and talk about, hey, the pros and cons and what Bobby did and how we're going to work together, right? When reunification happens, these parties have a really difficult time sitting in an office together, right? Maybe there's an order of protection and they can't sit in the office together. Right. Um, and so working with the family on, on how we're going to mesh and make this work now that we have two different households. And really then the reunification therapy in your position, when they're so diametrically opposed and not having any communication is a better form than going straight into family counseling. Would that be your position? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what are some behaviors or alienating behaviors that you think can be easily identified of things that need to be worked on? What are you seeing in your experiences? So most of the time I'm seeing is, you know, the kids, if, if we're still seeing the other parents, right, they will, you know, spend most of their time in their room, they'll isolate, right? So anytime that maybe the parent that they're seeing, you know, they're encouraging, hey, let's go do something, let's do activities, let me see your homework, you know, the kids are are rebelling and refusing to do anything. So they'll isolate themselves. Um, they won't tell the other party about what's happening at school, what, you know, maybe they went to the doctor, or maybe they got, you know, a new friend. They will not communicate, right, with that other person. Um, because most of the time, the favored parents could have said something um, or the kids overheard on, you know, maybe you know, I'm going to use dad here, maybe dad, right, shouldn't know about like what's happening at mom's house or what's happening at school on their time. Um, so those are some really common ones. Sure. The other common one is all of a sudden we have no good memories, right? Yeah. So history is kind of rewritten. So all these fun things that maybe you experienced with just a parent or when your parents were, were still together, um, all of those memories have been rewritten and nothing um, ever happened good. And what's causing that to occur? Why are the kids saying that? Most of the time it's influence from the other parent. From the favored parent. Then. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that needs to be broken. But now I'm thinking of the parent who's the rejected parent or unfavored parent, as you would call them, you know, how should they approach reunification therapy? I mean, you get in a lot of those situations where that's happened. History has been rewritten. You have absolutely no good memories of your childhood. Mm -hmm. So where does that parent start? So I would say that's it's going to be a long road, right? So the sooner that, you know, the court or whoever identifies some of these behaviors, the better the outcome of getting them in an office, right, to work on things with the parent that that's struggling. Um, because it's, th there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of tension, a lot of a lot of things like that. Um, a lot of times we agree to disagree, right? So by the time people make it to my office, you know, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're broke, right? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, when you're in my office, it's going to take a little bit of time, right? Because you're trying to build back that foundation of trust that right. has either been broken or, you know, said that it's broken. Um, and so really getting in the office and working on things and then 
we could agree to disagree and we're going to kind of move on. Right. And so really identifying what, you know, this rejected parent can do differently, right? Because I have kids that have this belief that these things have happened to them. So really working on, you know, what do the kids need from this unfavored parent? Because we're going to move on. Um, And so that is where all that support is really beneficial. Right. And certainly coming back and if they're having a visit, whether it's a short visit or whatever, coming back in your office and be able to talk through what happened, how did this go is really important. Now, when you say long-term, Give a parent an idea. I mean, reunification therapy is not going to happen overnight. So how long are we talking? So it really depends how long it's been going on, right? So, you know, I've had people in my office that, hey, they haven't seen their kids in three months. And, you know, after six or seven sessions, we start with things outside of my office, right? The worst case scenario, I mean, it could be a good year depending on how long things have been going on. Most of the work though, happens outside of my office. So we we come in my office, we really hash things out. We can't go back in the past. Lots of times people wanna spin things on the past and what people have done or acted. You know, We really wanna hash that out because most of the work is gonna be done outside of my office because I can't see how you react with each other when you're in my office. Right. Um, so, you know, going downstairs to dinner, right? And I always tell people, you know, I'm going to hear about it, right? I'm probably going to hear about the bad things before I hear about the good things. Right. Um, and so that's why I really like to get people out of my office to see how they're going to interact, you know, when I'm not around, because then those are tangible things that we can really work on. Right. And you, you know, you made an important point about you can't live in the past. I mean, what happened in the past happened. And at some point in time, I would assume that the goal is to move forward to reunify because you can't, we can all throw stones forever in any family situation. Would that be your normal response? Yes. So, I mean, my goal when people come to my office is to get them to some place of, of, of a relationship, right? So it might not be how maybe the unfavored parent remembers it, right? Of miraculous right. and it was amazing, right? It might not be how they remember it, but it's to get them to some place um, in a relationship. Got it. And I think that's real important. You know, we talk about the concept of breaking the ice. You know, I think breaking the ice, it's one thing at your office, but you're talking about the importance of going out and doing that first maybe dinner or maybe a movie, you know, these are the things. And I think that it has to occur in small increments. Would you agree with that? And what do you suggest to families within that structure? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm known for doing a stepping stone approach um, because I see more success when I do that versus, you know, I have these frustrated parents that want to see their kids and their parenting time. And I always explain to them, if I throw you in the fire, right, you're going to end up in the fire and we're going to be 10 times worse. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you unfortunately trust the process and we're going to go slower than, you know, usually the favored parent likes, but faster than what the, the other party wants or the children want Mm -hmm. um, to do these small steps. So the first step is being in my office and us, you know, being open to what the issues are. The next step is either texting or phone calls. Um, And then the next step is dinner. And then we kind of expand on that, um, you know, throughout the weeks or months or, you know, whatever the timeline is appropriate. You know, it seems to me that reunification therapy from a different perspective is really parents acting almost like a business-like transaction Mm -hmm. instead of wearing their emotions on their sleeves and saying, I was the injured party or you injured me or you falsely accused me because I mean, we can see both sides, right? Um, The gatekeeper versus the rejected parent or the favored parent versus rejected, however you want to put those labels on. So how is it best to break that ice? So, I mean, when I work with kids and families and they're going out on their first outing or even sometimes in my office, if it's, if it's really bad, right. We'll play a game. You know, I have 300 open-ended questions on, on, you know, getting to know you again, Um, because most of the time, you know, it's in this critical time period where these kids are at. And if they've been gone for, you know, a a significant amount of time, they don't even know who each other is. Right. right? Um, And so really working with them on just simple getting to know you activities um, before we kind of really, you know, 
dive in into the deep stuff. Um, I have rules when people go out outside of my office on what they can and can't talk about. So, you know, I really want them to keep to surface level things, right? Make up a story, talk about the weather, right? I mean, talk about the movies. I mean, anything right. except serious stuff um, because usually that gets everyone in trouble, right? Because we get emotional, right? right? And then another party is going to hear about what they talked about. And so um, I like to, to be the one that hears the important things and them just talking about, you know, surface level things outside of my office. Sure. So overall, I think what I'm taking away for parents is we all have to grow up. We have to let our kids have a relationship with both parents, because I think that what happens is, is that sometimes parents get short-sighted and they think they've been so wronged by one incident or they've wronged someone else. And as a result, these things fall apart and they don't need to, is that, would that be your assessment? Yes. And you know, the, the people that suffer the most are the children, right? Because, right. you know, they, as children feel, you know, that they should trust, you know, a parent. And so if I, if I have a parent that has really strong apparent opinions about the other parent, you know, they really influence more than, you know, they realize. Sure. And, you know, there's studies that, that show, right. When I have two parents involved in a healthy way, you know, sometimes I have parents that aren't involved in a healthy way. Um, but you know, there's less mental health risk, uh, when I have two parents involved in law in the children's lives. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really important thing right now, post COVID, we're seeing a lot of mental health issues in general. Yeah. And giving your children the freedom to make up their own mind, too. You know, we live in a world where everybody talks about the fact that, you know, people need to be able to choose. Well, let them do that at their adulthood, but don't deprive them of that opportunity in the interim period of time, right? When they're young. And yeah, so I get a huge, I mean, most of the kids that I see and kids that I see, you know, they report, no one's listening to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important, and I tell the parents this too, right? I am hearing you but that doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. Um, and I think that we have this entitled society, right? That I'm going to have my seven-year-old choose or my 14-year-old choose. Um, and my kind of feedback back to them is, are you going to let them choose not to go to school, right? At right. seven and 14. And usually that answer is, of course not. It's the same thing with seeing a parent. Once again, if they're both a healthy, you know, a healthy thing. Right. And you have to find that space. And, you know, I think that, you know, I often heard the line, you know, God doesn't allow you, you don't get to choose who your cousins are, but they're your cousins. So you got to get along. We've all heard that story probably when we were kids. It's kind of that concept in divorce too. Yes. You have two parents, you have to find a place that everybody can have that relationship. And that really is what reunification is necessary for in certain instances. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I always say also, how was your relationship before? Right. I mean, right. parents right. or parties were, you know, together before and there was no, you know, issue, but now there's this huge issue. Um, and so we have to kind of figure out how everyone's going to live in their new normal. Right. And moving forward. Well, I really appreciate your time today because what I'm hearing is something that really can be a positive experience to move past what's happened. We all can't change. We've all made mistakes in life. Right but we yes. can certainly move forward in a positive way for the sake of our children as well. Yeah, no, I think it's hugely important and can be beneficial. Very good. Well, Whitney, we appreciate your time so much and your expertise. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that those of you who are listening really take to heart what's going on and reach out and information can be shared accordingly. And we'll share your information as well, Whitney. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care.